Morning, everybody. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I just looked at my calendar, and uh, it was yesterday, it was 48 years ago that I gave my life to Jesus. 48. You didn't think I was that old, did you? And he's been faithful to keep me all this time. And uh, I just want to share my heart with you on, on a number of scriptures. We're going to begin with Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. Appreciate your prayers. Appreciate your offerings. We go frequently to the nations. Uh, next Friday, I go with the team from New Life Center to uh, Panama for uh, a nine or ten day trip there. And actually, then I'm, I'm actually taking November, December off on a rare rare time. I, this was my 10th trip. I start again in January and have a lot to do. There's a lot of work to do. Amen. And because of this message from this word today, Romans 1, 16 and 17, you have the ESV up there. I'll be reading NASB. Shouldn't be too much different. In fact, I can just read this. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Come on. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who what? Okay, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me in this, in this world, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the holy angels. How many believe that? You see, see the word up there, believe? You know, uh, oh, you already changed it. I'm sorry. Don't, don't run ahead of me, brother. You're trying to confuse the 67-year-old here. The word believe is so, so crucial for us all the time. You know, that word, uh, you know, it doesn't mean I believe this is an iPad on a stand. It's a, it's a word in the Greek that means uh, uh, trust in, rely on, adhere to. It's a, very, it's a very strong, strong word. And everywhere you see believe, 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 all throughout the New Testament. And that's what it means. It, it doesn't mean just something casual, but it means, it means what Jesus said. What are the two greatest commandments? To love the Lord... With all your what? All your, all your, and all your. How many know that's given at all? That's nothing casual. That's not a Sunday morning thing only. Or a Wednesday night thing or a small group thing. This is passion for Jesus. It's what you sang about today. You're, you're asking the Holy Spirit to come and change you. Well, He wants to. He wants to change us. Because that's our only hope. Our only hope is to cling to trust and rely on what He tells us. And then, when we do that, when you do that, by the way, if you really believe, if you're really a believer, a cling to, a clinger, if you're really a clinger to Jesus, you might be called, we're a bunch of Klingons. <laughs> in, a good, in a good sense. If you're really hanging on to Jesus, you're going to believe everything He says. Everything, not just part of it. This isn't the cafeteria where you go down through the table and pick what you want and leave the rest. You, you take his word for what he says, and you believe, you cling to, trust, and rely on what he says. That's what we're talking about here. And the apostle's telling us, I'm not ashamed. I want everybody to know, not only my family and my church, I want everybody that I come in contact with to know that I am not ashamed of Jesus. We live in a crazy world, don't we? I mean, there's nuts out there. I never thought I'd live long enough to see so many nuts running around. But we've got it today. By the way, please go vote. Please go vote. Hold your nose and vote Republican, okay? That's all I'll say about that. You see, in the gospel is the power of God. You know, you can't get saved by your own strength. Every one of us in this room, if we are truly a Christian this morning, we miserably failed trying to do it on our own. Every one of us. We are miserable failures in our carnal nature. When you, when you uh, gave your life to Jesus, don't, don't you wish that you just killed that carnal nature in you? But every day you get up, you deal with it again. It's something that we have to face every, every day. 
the reality of the human nature, and the human nature cannot please God. Listen to me now. Your natural self cannot please God. I know you're a wonderful person, Mr. Wonderful, Mrs. Wonderful, but you cannot please Him. Everything we do naturally conflicts, goes against, contradicts the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a believer today, you have to believe that. I mean, you can't say, oh, well, that's crazy. You're old school. I am old school, and I might be crazy, but it's the truth. You have to believe that you yourself are, your big, you are the biggest enemy of yourself. There's only one person that can help you. It's Jesus Christ. The power of God is what we need. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Greek. It doesn't matter how old you are, what century or millennia you live in. It's the power of the gospel that will save you. So let's not be ashamed. Amen? Let's go to the next scripture. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18. Got that, brother? You were trying to put it up there before. Come on, don't fall asleep on me back. There we go. Okay, for the word of the cross, or the message of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are what? Okay, who are perishing? It's the unbelievers. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not but have everlasting life. You see, the perishing ones are the ones that need to be rescued. Rescue the perishing. Remember that one? You ever sing that? I am old school. But to those who are what? Being saved, it is the power of God. You see, the message of the cross to unbelievers doesn't make any sense at all. Why would this Jewish man come and die for me? Why would anybody shed his blood so that I could be saved? These things are, there we go. You see, naturally, it doesn't make any sense. It, it absolutely, uh, naturally, it, it is foolishness. That's what it says. If you're not a believer, the message of the cross means nothing. But if you are truly a believer, you're being saved. How many know that you're being saved? You are being saved. That means until we step on the other side, we truly aren't saved. Amen? We are being saved. We, uh, we fa have faith that we're saved. We believe what he says. But we are being saved, and so the cross to us is the power of God. Come on. It's not foolishness. It's power. That's why I cannot be ashamed of this message of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, perfect man, son of man, son of God, who gave it all for me. Not only for me, for you. Not only for you, but for the sins of the entire human race, if you believe. If you're a Klingon. Next scripture. 1 Corinthians 2, 1-5. 1 Corinthians 2, 1-5. <laughs> Good job. Those guys aren't going to help me anymore. <laughs> and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I have a lot more in that. One to five. Okay. Uh, let me read it here. I, I, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or, or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Come on, simple message. you got to talk about Jesus. you got to talk about Him dying. People need to hear that. Amen? I was, Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Do you ever feel like that? Get up here and try to preach sometime. You'll feel like that. <laughs> and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, meaning the wisdom of the world. You know, you, you ever hear this political spin? They just spew it out and they just like they, they think you're going to believe it just because they say it. The wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world cannot help us. If you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will not get any assistance. 
it will destroy you. It is earthly, carnal, and demonic, the wisdom of this world. And that's how they operate out there. You can't do both. You can't serve two masters. You can't love God and love the world. If you're doing it, stop. That's why you're so messed up. The Holy Spirit doesn't mess you up. The world messes you up. The world at all, you know, come on, the devil, here's what the devil says. You, you don't have to listen to him. Come over here. Eat, eat this fruit. It'll make you smart. You'll be a smarty pants. Mr. Know-it-all, Mrs. Know-it-all. That's what the world's turned to. And people fight and hate each other and call each other names and murder each other. You know, they rape and pillage and abuse each other. That's what's going on out there in the world. It's not of God. It can never be of God. So run away from it. What we need is a demonstration of the Holy Ghost. You ever call him Holy Ghost? That's old King James. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to come in all my weakness, in all my fear and my trembling. I need you not to give me words of this world that will persuade people, but I need the demonstration, come on, the demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Come on, power of God. That's what we need. We don't need the wisdom of the world. Unfortunately, much, uh, much of our church experience in the United States has become a worldliness, a worldly wisdom experience. It's become business-oriented and uh, numbers-oriented and money-oriented instead of Jesus-oriented. It's not the message of the cross. It's not the message of sacrifice of self-denial and following Jesus. But it's a message of, oh, you can live your best life now. Come on, give me an offering and all your debt problems will disappear. You'll become a rich man, a rich woman. You can fly a big old jet plane like me. That's not me. I, don't, I just, I fly economy. <laughs> economy plus when I can get it. With my status with United. Let's go to Romans uh, 10, 12, 12 to 15. Romans 10, 12 to 15. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches. For all who what? See that word call? I want you to remember that. The ones who call on the Lord will be saved. There's an Old Testament quote here. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's an Old Testament quote in the New Testament. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Romans 10, 12 to 15. Do you know from the perspective of the Lord that when we preach the gospel, we have beautiful feet? Do you all know your feet are beautiful when you preach the gospel? Other times, not so much. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news. Romans 6 tells us that when we are prepared to preach the gospel, it's effective spiritual warfare against Satan. What this world needs is a lot of preaching. We don't need gimmicks, paradigms, programs, something new. So the, millenn- so the millennials will come. Oh, I must have been done something wrong. Did I blow it out? <laughs> something new so these young people all come. Old people, were not. Ah, they'll come anyway. Don't worry about them. <laughs> Do you ever feel like that, old people? 
Always want the young people in. That's good. We want to reach the young people. But let me tell you something. We dare not compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ to keep someone coming to meetings. We've got to preach it as it is because what they need, they need to hear the gospel. The priority of the church is sending the preachers out, the worker. I preach, I teach this overseas all the time. How are they going to hear? How are they going to preach unless they're sent? Does that make sense? So we got to send them. How are the, the unbelievers going to hear without a preacher? They won't. And how are they going to believe, cling, be a cling on? How are they going to cling on Jesus if they've not heard? I heard you praying to have ears to hear today. And eyes to see. May it be so. And how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? You see, it, beyond clinging to Jesus, there's another step. It's called call on the name of the Lord. Here's what happens. Someone preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You preach about Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his perfect life, his perfect sacrifice, his miraculous ministry, how God had planned from the very beginning to send his son to be the salvation of the whole world. People need to hear that. They need to understand that the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. They need to understand that there's no, no one is righteous, not even one. There's no person that, that is, is escaping the wrath of God unless they become a clinger on Jesus. You have to have this Eyes to see and ears to hear. It's, it's an unveiling by the Holy Spirit of your individual need. Your individual need is that without Jesus, you are lost on your way to hell. And then finally, the lake of fire. The lake of fire is, a, is an eternal, never-ending experience of wrath, the wrath of God. You say, well, I don't want to believe that. Too bad. God believes it. You see, this is coming. This is a reality for every unbeliever that's ever, ever lived and died. There, there is no hope for the person who hasn't turned to cling to Jesus. There just isn't. This is why we ought to have such an urgency in this world of nearly 8 billion people to, to go out everywhere and not be ashamed of this, but tell people, folks, it's getting late. You're getting older. How many know people are dying that you know every week? Some of them are very young. We need to tell them that without Jesus, you can't be saved. There is no other way to heaven. Don't, don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in vain religion. Some form of godliness that doesn't have any power, but you've got to put your trust in the only one who is qualified to save you, Jesus Christ. His name, His blood, His power. You know, when, when you understand that, I go back 48 years, now it's hard to remember back that, lo that far, but the Holy Spirit drew me to a place in my life where I believed Jesus. I'm telling you, that's exactly what happened to me. I was, I was living a, you know, a carnal life uh, at the IUP and, and you know, doing all the stuff that carnal people do when they're 18, 19 years old. It's even worse now, but we were, we were bad enough, except John Pride. He was worse. <laughs> Look at him. Look how innocent he looks. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit began to draw me. You know how he did it? By me reading the New Testament. A, a friend of mine in a fraternity of all places, you know, it wasn't a good one either. He, he, uh, he was a good friend, but the fraternity wasn't good. He gave me a, a good news from modern man Bible, a New Testament. He said, I just made my life, committed my life to Jesus. I hope that you'll read this. And, you know, I grew up in church, but I never took seriously the words of Jesus <laughs> till at that point in my life, God was stirring in me, and I didn't even know what it was. And I began to read the words of Jesus from Matthew to Revelation, I read that, that thing over and over again. I started skipping classes to read the New Testament. I don't recommend that, but it worked for me. 
And I came to a point 48 years ago, lying in my bunk, in a, a bunk beds in a, a filthy old fraternity house. Everybody else was off the class. I'm laying there reading the New Testament. I came to a decision. I'm go- I believe Jesus. And I gave, I gave him everything. I just gave him my life. And you know what happened? I was changed instantaneously. 48 years ago. And a short time later, I got filled with the Spirit. I went on. I didn't get it in the right order, but I did get water baptized later. And the Lord just started pouring out His grace upon my life. And I've been serving Him all these years. Have I made mistakes? Yes. Have I ever fallen away? No. Not once. Because it's the grace of God. Because I'm a clinger to Jesus. And He showed me where I was and where I was going, which was to hell. And I believed His words. I began to cling to His words. Not what my fraternity brothers told me. Not what the university told me. Not what my own family told me. But I believed the words of Jesus. And you know what it led me to do? Or He led me to do the whole... It was the Holy Spirit. He led me to cry out desperately to be saved. That's what it means to call upon the Lord. It's not some casual, oh, come on, let's just call upon the Lord today and be saved. This is a strong better stay here. This is a strong word to call on the Lord. After you believe, you've got to call on the Lord. That means cry out to Him with all you've got. Lord, have mercy on me. How many know that God gives grace only to the humble? No proud person will ever get grace. Pride is the original sin of angels and men. When I say angels, you know I mean Satan and all the fallen angels and of all the human beings that have ever lived except Jesus. That pride will get us in deep trouble with the Lord. It separates us from Him. He resists us. He fights against that because it represents everything, everything about our carnal nature that, that is anti-Christ. But when I humble myself, what do I do? When I humble myself, I say, I'm done with that. I, I'm finished with the world. It has done nothing but torment me. It's leading me to hell. My life is, uh, is falling apart. When I was, I remember when I was in 10th grade, I thought I was a pretty wholesome kid. I probably was compared to everybody else, you know, but then it started going downhill. I'm telling you every year after that, till I got saved at 19, I, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't going to continue The way I used to be, but I'm getting worse and worse all the time. And that led me to the stark realization that I need help. Now, if you're a Christian today, you had a similar experience. Somewhere in your life, you you realized that you were lost. If you never had that experience, my friend, I don't even believe you're a Christian today. If you didn't have that Come to a conflict in your life, the conviction of God working in your life and revealing to you that you are lost so that you could believe the words of Jesus above the things of the world and cry out to Him and have a supernatural change in your life. Come on. That's what the world needs. They don't need to be schmoozed and compromised with. You don't need to tell people how wonderful they are when they're a bunch of rascals. Do you ever hear the preachers pre- preach these people into heaven after they die? I mean, they live like a rascal on the earth. That's not good. That's, you know, when I say rascal, you know, that's, that's a hypocrite, sinner, never right with God, and the preacher preaches them into heaven. Happens every day. I'm telling you on the day of judgment, there are going to be a lot of surprises. People are going to be surprised. I better keep going here. John 16, 7 to 11. Jesus said, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, we're speaking of the Holy Spirit now, amen? When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Uh, how many know that when you, if you had spent three, three, three and a half years with Jesus, personally living with them, traveling with them, the recipient of that, that, that unusually exemplary life, the only human being that ever lived without sin, and, and not only that, but all the miracle signs and wonders, how many know that would be a revival meeting every day? And when he told them, look, I'm leaving you guys, you could understand how sad they were. They were grieved by that. But he told them, look, it's to your advantage. I'm here with you now. I've been with you for three years. I prepared this, uh, this thing for you, this kingdom for you. But I'm here, and I need to go back to my Father. I, I've limited myself to a human body. I am the Son of God. I am the Son of Man. But I, I can't be everywhere at one time. But guess who can be? The Holy Spirit. Now, He is everywhere at once. Everywhere I go, every nation I, pr I preached in, over 40 nations, every nation I've ever preached in, every culture I've ever preached in, the Holy Spirit is there. And when you proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same thing happens. The Holy Spirit begins to work on the people. Sometimes they get up and leave. Other times they listen intently and they, they understand. In their hearts they believe what you're saying. You know who I'm looking for? I'm looking for the ones that believe. That's my job. My job is to find the clingers to Jesus. That's why I can't be ashamed of the gospel. That's why I can't be trying to please you. I've got to tell you the truth because, my friends, the only thing that will set you free is the truth. The Holy Spirit, His purpose in the world is to convict the world. Say convict with me. That's a tough word. You know, when you're under conviction, it's not a pleasant experience. I almost walked over there again. See how dumb I am? I, my dog would have done better than me on that. When you're under conviction, you're miserable. You're stirred up. You're sitting there squirming in your seat. I'm telling you, have, having been under conviction many times, I know, I know what the experience is. That's why the Holy Spirit has come. He hasn't come to make you feel like you're the, the best, number one, top-notch, righteous person on this earth. He's come to show you who you really are. He's come to convict the world of sin. Why? Because they don't cling to me. They don't believe in me. You understand that the unbelievers don't believe, so some force of heaven called the Holy Spirit, the power of God, he's come, He comes to convince them that they're messed up. Now on the day of Pentecost, there were thousands and thousands of Jews jamming into the city of Jerusalem for the feast. And when, when the Holy Spirit fell, and that whole demonstration of power, and the, the speaking of tongues and the fire, and all, all that demonstration, all these people were drawn to it, and Peter, who was afraid a few weeks ago to even say, I know who this guy is, he stood up boldly and began to preach under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he told those people, you killed the Messiah. His blood is on your hands. He is God's plan, God's choice for you. There is no other way you could be saved. He put his neck right out there. There were 3,000 people that day, out of all those thousands, 3,000 people, that sounds like a lot of people, doesn't it? That's bigger than Ford City is now, which is better than Catanning, by the way, I want you to know. <laughs> 3,000 people did what? They were cut to the heart. Do you know what that is? That's conviction. The Holy Spirit took the words of, of Peter and like a, like a two-edged sword of the Word of God began to do surgery in their lives and they were so convicted that they could almost see the blood of Jesus on their hands. And what was their response? Not of everyone, but of those 3,000. What did they say? What must I do to be saved? 
My friends, when you're being bold with the gospel, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for people that respond that way. You're not looking for everybody that, you know, everybody's important, you know, but they don't believe. You're not looking for the young ones and they don't believe. You're not looking for the old ones that don't believe. But you're looking for the ones that will cling to Jesus. This is our responsibility. We're not supposed to worry about everyone. We're supposed to preach to everyone, yes. But we are supposed to disciple believers. Read your New Testament, you'll figure that out. When they reject the word, shake the dust off and go somewhere else. Do you believe Jesus? I don't believe him in that case because that's a little radical. That's how he taught them to evangelize. You go find the people that receive you. You stay there. You disciple them. They'll take care of you. But the ones that reject your ministry and your message and warn them. That it would be better on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you because you've rejected the gospel. This is serious business, folks. He not only convicts of sin, but he convicts of righteousness. Why does he need to convict of righteousness? Jesus says here, he says, because uh, I go to the Father and you don't see him anymore. The only standard of righteousness that's ever lived is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit has to be a, a testimony through the lives of us, true believers, clingers, so that we can demonstrate by the grace of God the same righteousness that Jesus showed the world. And only the Holy Spirit can do that in you and in me. Unfortunately, today, what have we got? We've got a bunch of hypocrites roaming the churches, present excluded, right? Everybody's excluded here. Hypocrites in the church do not draw people to Jesus. People that know you and know you're a hypocrite say about your church, I don't want to go there. If, they, if Christians are like that, I don't want to go there. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a nice thing to say, but that's what they say. But if you, if you live for Jesus... And you walk as a light of the world, the salt of the earth, and you show people the righteousness of Christ. Yes, they will still turn on you, but for the right reasons. They hate you because they hate Jesus, not because you're a hypocrite. How many see the difference? Not only does the Holy Spirit have to convict people of sin and righteousness, but judgment. And, and the Scripture says because the devil has already been judged. The devil is a great deceiver, and he is keeping the eyes and the ears of the people closed to the revelation of the gospel. He is lying continually. He's the father of lies, and he's got people duped into think he's very powerful, and he's going to get you if, you if you preach about Jesus. But I'm telling you, the devil, his home is the lake of fire. That's where he's going to be forever and ever. And he trembles hearing the word of God because he knows that's where he's going. He believes that word of God, but he doesn't obey it. One final little scripture I want to read to you, and then I'm done here. Acts 24, 24 to 25. But for some days, this is the Apostle Paul. But for some days later, Felix, or some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess. And sent for Paul and heard him speak about, what did he speak about? Faith in Christ Jesus. Come on. Do you know that we're only saved by faith? And we're saved by grace. The door to grace is faith. Faith and grace are gifts that come from him. You and I naturally don't have it. He's got to impart that to us. Here's some faith. Here's a measure of faith for you. And you say, wow. I believe that. You begin to cling to Jesus, and the grace of God begins to pour into your life, to change you. That, that's my testimony. The only good thing in my life is because of the grace of God. Nothing else. And Paul preached this. He preached about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, look what he was discussing with them. I, I found, this jumped out at me this week when I was going through this with my devotions. What, while he was discussing righteousness... Self-control and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I'll call you back. I'll summon you. 
Felix was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit because what was Paul, what did Paul knew he needed to preach about? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's what he was preaching about. He was talking about the, the problem was a lack of self-control among people. That's the sin. That because they don't believe. He was talking about judgment and surely included the judgment that's on the, the prince of darkness. And, and he talked about uh, righteousness, which surely had to lift up Jesus. Come on. These brothers and sisters of the first century believed Jesus. They were clingers to Jesus. And they knew that they had to preach as Jesus preached. They had to live as Jesus lived. They were not ashamed of the gospel. There is no power anywhere else except in the foolishness of preaching. Come on, stand up with me now. That's 36 minutes. Is that okay? I even time myself because I, I can get carried away. And you say, I know that. I've experienced that. What we need is more of the Word of God. We need to become those who cling to, trust, and rely on the Word of God. The Word of God is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without the Word of God, we cannot, we cannot have our faith challenged or, or increased. Faith comes by hearing the Word, and the, the Word is Jesus. Amen? You and I need to, we, we need to be firmly convinced that the worldly life that I used to live has to go. It has to go. See, the problem in our churches today, I get to visit quite a few. The problem in our churches today is we brought the world in with us. And we're struggling with the world, and we wonder why we're having problems. Jesus said, I want you to come and die. And you say, well, I, believe, I want to cling to Jesus, but I don't want to die. You know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. Have you noticed that? We are to die to ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. It's all about denial, humility, and faithfulness, clinging to Jesus, and allowing the Holy Spirit to come into my life and change me. That's what you sang about this morning. We used to say back in the day, sing what you believe and believe what you sing. You don't sing it for some emotional reason, but you're singing it, as I'm sure you were, as a prayer. God, change me. Anyone here today, you realize, hey, you realize you, 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 are, you are kind of double-minded in your approach to serving Jesus. Uh, you you want to believe? But you're more like, you're more like the, the one, uh, the priest that Scripture says about J Jesus. They, they, they began to believe in Jesus, same word, but in context, it said, but they were afraid to confess him because they didn't want the high priest to throw him out. How many see that's not, that's not the way we should be serving Jesus? I'm not ashamed. You see, what kind of soil are you this morning? Are you the a soil on rocky ground that the devil comes and chomps it up before it ever even gets in your heart? Are you, are you the, the rocky ground? You've got some soil in there, but too many rocks. And, and yeah, that was a great message. Chuck King really preached today. I, I wish all those people that stayed away because he was here were here to hear what he said. You know, I receive it with joy. I preach to 100 Ugandan pastors, and every, every message they repented every day for three days. Do I think all 100 of them are going to go out and change Uganda? No. Because they're receiving it with joy. But guess what happens? Opposition comes. Persecution comes. And it weeds out many people. And they run away. They fall away. I hope you're not that kind of soil. Third soil is full of thorns. Take the word in, but the thorns represent the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. America has a big problem with this. And there's no fruit because of the love of this world. But I can't help, help it, my friends. What did Jesus say? You will know them by their, not by their church attendance, although that's good. 
Not the way you sing, emotionally praise the Lord. That's good too. But by your fruit, the outcome of your life. Are you demonstrating the Word of God in your life? The way you live. That's what it means. There was only one group out of four that produced any fruit. They were the ones that took, took away. They had, their, they had their ground plowed up. They took away the rocks. They took away the weeds. And when the seed of the Word of God came in, it could grow. How many know the seed of the Word of God grows in a mysterious way? You don't know how it grows, even as a farmer. You know, uh, you know Andrew plants that stuff on his little, his little farm that he has over there. I've never been there, but I understand. God, anybody that has 26 chickens, it's got to be a farm, right? <laughs> he puts that stuff in the ground. Does he, does he keep digging it up every day to see if it's growing? No, he, he puts that in there, and he puts his faith in the Lord, and the, guess what the Lord does? He, he causes everything to work out. Have you learned that's the way it should be in your life? Holy Ghost, change us. Rule my life. Make the changes you need to make. Is there anybody here that needs more of God? Because you know that you're struggling. And you want to come and pray right now. You want, you want us to pray for you. Because you don't want to be, you don't want to be double-minded. You, you, want, you want to be a clinger to Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Come on. I'm calling for the Klingons to come up here. You want to cling on. You don't, you don't want to fade away. You don't want to be like the ones that fall away, the ones that don't bear any fruit. You, you're tired of the world. Look what the world's done to you. You know it. I'm your friend. I just had enough guts to tell you that. That's my job, to tell you how messed up you are. <laughs> you might not think that's a very loving, kind thing, but it's the most loving, kind thing I could say to you this morning. Come on, step forward here. If you want prayer, come in a little closer. Make room for some other people. Anybody else need to come? Come on. We're just here, brothers and sisters. We are a family, aren't we? Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is your local fellowship. You love each other. The Bible says confess your sins one to another, that you might be healed. That's the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel says that if you are messed up, call the elders of the church and they'll pray for you. And even your sins will be taken care of. How many know that's a New Testament altar call? Come on, brother. Lead your people now. I'm done.